Hello. We have a guest today, very well known, Grandmaster Larry Christiansen. And our topic today is a Zemish variation of King's Indian. We have several DVDs made how to play King's Indian for black, but this time we have to cover something, we're going to cover something for white. And this is going to be Zemish variation that Larry is very good at and one of the best known specialists in this uh, in this part of the opening in this variation so here is Larry and enjoy sit back enjoy and learn hi everybody this is Larry Christensen and uh, we'll be talking about the same as King's Indian first I thought I might talk a little bit about why I uh, got interested in playing the same as King's Indian the King's Indian defense which is characterized by the fianchetto of his king bishop uh, this is your basic position. Often leads to uh, very nice black counterattacks, uh, pawn storms against the castled white king on the king's side. And as a youngster, I never liked being on the receiving end of a king's side attack. I like to be on the delivering end. So I looked around, uh, this is around 1980s, I uh, looked around for an opening, a line against the king's Indian where white controlled events, where white did the attacking, where white pushed black around. And so I hit upon the famous Samish King's Indian, which is characterized by the move F3. Purpose of that F3 move, pawn move, is to anchor, secure that, fortify that pawn on E4, set up a beautiful safe haven for the dark squared bishop on e3 and to also promote a possible spike attack later on on the downside the pawn move f3 does tend to weaken dark squares um, notably e3 um, f4 that area d4 and it does little to uh, does not it's not a developing move it's a pawn move not a not a peace move but i still think the the pluses outweigh the the minuses <clears throat> okay let's uh, now before moving to the main our main th area i should talk a little bit about uh, some rare sidelines let's say black for instance now played e5 uh, inviting white to trade pawns and trade queens depriving black of the right to castle that's a anemic uh, wimpy line we don't need to play that way I'd rather keep the tension in the center knight ge2 and follow up with bishop e3 and queen d2 keep the tension and with a view towards castling queen side most of the time black will play here castles and I mean when I say most of the time it's probably 95 percent of the time and I like now Bishop e3 that's the good save good solid attacking move and also now white's ready to play Queen d2 creating a battery of Queen and Bishop on that diagonal now after Bishop e3 black has quite a number of choices uh, the most popular here on no question about it are e5 Knight c6, that's the Pano variation. Uh, the gambit line c5, which will not be the focus of our discussion in this video. And you have some side lines like knight bd7 and c6. Uh, if black plays e5, white has several options, but I think the attacking player's option would now be knight ge2 keeping the tension in the center and staying keeping our focus on Queen d2 followed by long castling now after Knight g e2 let's say black plays oh Knight Knight bd7 white plays Queen d2 now black plays c6 
and White Castle is long. Now he's he's got a very nice attacking formation ready if Black plays particularly sluggishly to follow with H moves like H4 and G4. Um, if Black plays correctly, White can pursue a more positional approach, maybe moves like King B1. And uh, if B5, for instance, uh, White can play pawn takes C5, E5, pawn takes E5, and now that knight on E2 has a new square, C1, where it can maneuver to. And here, White would pursue a, queen, a positional strategy, uh, applying pressure on that on the D file, and also Black's weak squares like C5, uh, D6. This knight on C1, for instance, very well can maneuver to B3 very effectively. <clears throat> so let's return to our position after Bishop E3. So again, I, I advocate if against e5, keep the tension in the center and pursue the plan of queen d2 and long castles. Just for the record, if you pl if you close the center, black has some very tricky lines like knight h5. We don't we need to this is the kind of line that we don't need to deal with. Intending queen h4 check. So let's return and go back to what we I consider the most critical line of the King's Indian, and that is knight c6. So now we'll talk about the uh, knight c6 line, also known as the Pano variation. The Pano variation is basically designed to entice white into advancing his pawns in the center, but for instance, with d5. When that happens, that's usually bad. Black plays knight e5, and sooner or later, usually sooner, white's pawn, center, will come under attack by means of c6, possibly e6. It'll get chopped away, and assuring black excellent counterplay, good squares for his pieces. Generally just not a good idea, and, and a total distraction from our real goal, which should be to launch a kingside attack. Okay, so after knight c6, a much better way to, con two better ways to play, either queen d2 or knight g2, they're very similar and they often transpose. For our purposes, we'll play knight g2. I just like to get my knights developed and uh, and go from there. Now black's, if black now plays e5, which a lot of people might think, oh, gee, that must be the right move, and white does fix the center. He plays d5. He chases that knight to a bad square, e7. That's a terrible square for the knight, where it is dominated by white's pawn structure. That f5 square and the c6 squares are now occupied, and and the knight's crowded in by his own pieces, uh, g8, c8, and g6. And here. White will be in position very shortly to play queen d2, g4, and h4, followed by h5 and the standard and typically crushing kingside attack. So knight e7, a j terrible lemon. e5 is a terrible lemon. Black should play a6. That's uh, the correct move. And the purpose behind a6 is to play for a quick b7, b5 to launch counterplay aimed at the future hiding spot of the white king, queen side. Well, after a6, white should just continue queen d2, uh, setting up the queen bishop battery. He may or may not trade dark squared bishops depending on circumstances. Uh, also that prepares long castling. And now black should continue again, rook b8 to promote b7, b5. Uh, very passive move is bishop d7. And you still see that once in a while even by very strong grandmasters. And 
Bishop d7, now the idea behind that move, it's just a generic developing move, but it really does not, uh, and it just really doesn't do that much for black's position. I think uh, here's a good example of how white, white should handle the attack. He goes h4. Now, most of the time, black cannot afford to let black, white play h5. So he responds by h5. So if white tries to open lines, he's going to pay a price for it. The price of admission, for instance, on the king's side will be g4, hg4, and white uh, lacks sufficient counterplay for his, his pawn investments. But uh, a better move here for white would be bishop h6, trading off uh, dark squared bishops. And uh, black now reacts in the center with e5. And uh, the purpose of that move now, if white plays d5, maybe black can jump into d4 actively, or perhaps even capture on h6. Queen takes h6, and then play knight d4. And white's being, he's a bit distracted by black's activity in the center. His attack can run aground. So here, a uh, better move is castles, holding everything in place and getting the rook on d1 and suddenly into action. And let's say black plays b5. Well, this will be similar to our, the main line I'll de be discussing later. Then white should just play knight d5 to eliminate black's stalwart defensive piece that knight on f6. And this gives black uh, severe headaches, uh, defensive headaches. Uh, he can either accept a positionally inferior game with moves like knight takes d5 and c takes d5 and knight takes d4 and knight takes d4, e takes d4. Bishop takes g7, king takes g7. Now here white doesn't need to attack. He can just play positionally. And uh, queen takes d4 check. He's got a very, very nice pawn structure. Black has a very weak pawn on c7. White's no doubt going to quickly move his king to b1 and bring a rook to c1. Uh, if black trades queens, his end game is inferior because of that weak c pawn. It's all risk, uh, no, all gain and little, very little risk for white in this position. So you do see bishop d7 once in a while, but it's considered too passive to really bother white. So, back to our uh, main line, rook b8 is clearly uh, superior to bishop d7. b7, b5 uh, is now on the agenda for black. And that will, that has a influence on white center plus it creates play for black on the queen side. There's no question about it. And this line is the subject now of much debate. And I've wrestled with this line for many, many years. Once upon a time, I liked the move knight c1. I won quite a number of games with it. Uh, but eventually, I just became dissatisfied with this move based on the answer de5 d5 and knight d4 and to make a long story short after knight b3 c5 it's all best play d takes c6 
B takes C6, exclamation point. Knight takes knight. We can't live and let a knight like that hang around for long. E takes D4, bishop takes D4. Now white's a pawn up, but his king is stuck in the center. Rook E8, bishop E2, D5. Black has a very nice game. Uh, even though he's down a pawn, he's got compensation in the form of very active, dangerous play. Black and white must be very careful here. Uh, for attackers, this is the kind of we're getting. We're on the receiving end of counterplay. We're not the givers of the attack. We're not leaders at leading the attack. So let's go back and discuss some other continuations till so I finally think I hit on the right way to play this. Back to our position after rook b8. Now I should also talk about, I, I also have tried bishop h6, which uh, is an attractive move and trading off dark squared bishops. It's the first move you think about. The problem with bishop h6 though is that black can now just respond with b5 getting his pieces it's safer than taking some people are might be tempted to play bishop takes h6 queen takes h6 and e5 I've actually faced that move not a good idea for a defender okay so uh, now let's give an example here what happens if black plays something passive like bishop d7 I have right in front of me a pretty good example play a game played uh, this between uh, Grandmaster Bu Zhangji and Grandmaster Vadim Svyagenzev played in the Russian Team Championship in 2008. And uh, I think also this is a very good illustration of how white should attack uh, in this line of the Samish Kings Indian. So white played here plays Bishop H6. Um, sometimes good, sometimes bad. Yeah, not, not never bad, but sometimes not the most effective. Here I think it is the most effective, especially combined with the main theme, which is uh, a later knight d5. So black answered bishop h6, standard way, reacts to, in the center with e5. White castles. And now black starts his counterplay with b5. So he's stirring up trouble as quickly as possible on uh, white's king. And now Boo plays knight d5 to eliminate that powerful knight, that key defensive piece, the knight on f6. The knight on f6 is not just uh, near the black king, it's also helping to guard the g2, g4 square. So it must be eliminated. And here's Vyagensev played rook e8. White immediately gets down to work with g4. Now because of the threat of, of exchanging those knights, this move is now feasible. h takes g4. And white pursues his attack with h5. And so here, what happens if uh, black plays, oh, let's say knight takes h5. Here's what happens, very thematic too. White then plays bishop takes g7, king takes g7, and now knight g3, threatening to trade off uh, that knight on h5. If knight takes g3, queen h6 check delivers mate. King g8, queen h8, mate. So back here, uh, after knight g3, let's say black plays rook h8 to fortify his uh, king position. Well, then white plays knight takes h5 check. Uh, let's say black now plays g takes h5. White will then play f takes g4 opening more lines 
Black tries to keep it as closed as possible. Bishop takes g4. And here, White has the luxury of, of uh, playing Bishop e2. And Black's king is getting increasingly exposed. His Black's defenses are being whittled down. And there's that's very powerful knight on d5 as the star of our show. Black uh, has, is very hard pressed to withstand the attack. The rook on d1 is soon to go to g1. Black can have that pawn on d4. Let's say knight takes d4. White can follow that up with bishop takes g4, h takes g4, and now rook g1 is. Uh, very unpleasant for black. White has a very strong attacking play here. Let's go back. and watch how the actual game progressed. After g4. <clears throat> Black took on g4. h5. And I might also add, I think uh, knight takes h5, white can even play knight g3 directly. The point being, knight takes g3, bishop takes g7. Now, king takes g7 leads to checkmate. And if knight takes h1, here comes the queen, barreling down to h6, threatening checkmate. And, uh, well, black has no defense. f6, uh, among many, many, many wins, bishop takes f6 looks simple enough. Very convincing, threatening mate numerous ways, and the queen. Black quickly collapses. So after g4, the characteristic g4, Black took on g4, h5, and Black now played g takes f3. He's paying, trying to make white pay an extremely high price for uh, opening all these lines. White captured on g6. Doesn't hesitate to sacrifice material for the pursuit of his attack. Black countered that with f takes g6. This is uh, if, if f takes g2, white can now play bishop takes g7 surrendering the, the rook. He takes d1 equals queen check. King takes d1. And uh, now white's threatening mate in two. And if he plays king takes g7, that leads to checkmate with queen h6 mate. Black really has no defense, despite his rook advantage of material. Note how ruthless white is in opening lines. I mean, that is the name of the game here. Not waste, no wasted motion. Sack, sack, deliver mate. Rip open, you know, tear open the uh, the black defenses. So after h takes g6, black played f takes g6. And now white uh, conserves his knight on, on e2 for attacking purposes. It supports its brother on d5, knight e2 to c3. So white has, let's take stock here, white has five pawns, black has seven. But he's already punched a gaping hole in black's king's king position. The pawn on f3 really doesn't mean much. And then knight on d5 is just dominating the position. And of course, 
Black King is uh, about to face the music uh, after Bishop takes g7. So here Black played Knight takes d4 and he was quickly swamped after Bishop takes g7, King takes g7, Knight takes f6, Queen takes f6. So he's finally traded off the, the key Black defensive piece. And now knight d5, attacking that queen, sending it back to f8. And white now came in with queen h6 check. Black tries to run. White stops him from running with queen g5. And threatens now rook h7 check, murderous threat. And black answered that with queen g7. And now the this theme of this game is eliminating key defenders. White delim eliminates now the Black's pride and joy on d4. Rook takes d4. E takes d4. That's uh, Black's last line of defense has been breached. And now queen f4 check. And suddenly Black notices if he plays king e6, that's lead checkmate in one move. And king g8, knight f6 check is also not appealing. So in desperation, Mr. Svyagenzev played bishop f5. And now white's attack reached critical mass. E takes f5, g5, trying to keep lines closed. White plays queen g4, now he's accessing the h5 square. That's the threat. And black he took into account black's uh, last gasp here. Rook e1 check, king d2, rook a e8. And now uh, after queen h5 check, black recognized that uh, there is no good defense to the upcoming f6. Now let's take a quick look, see if, for instance, king g8, white plays f6. And the queen's got nowhere to go. If it goes to f7, white delivers checkmate. If it goes to f8, he delivers mate. And if he goes to d7, well, that's not much of a help either. f7 check, queen takes f7, and mate anyway. We get the idea also in this position, if king f8, f6, the same story, essentially. If queen f7, queen h6 check, followed by mate next move. And if queen g8, white surrenders that pawn again with f7. And again, if queen takes f7, now we deliver mate, queen h8 check, queen g8, queen f6 check, queen f7, and rook h8 checkmate. A good thematic game, well worth reviewing. Uh, for It's a, it's a must-know game, a good example of how to blast open lines, sacrifice material within reason and go after the black king and it's games like that that illustrate how why passive moves like bishop d7 have lost favor move now so bishop d7 is uh, considered slightly second rate black's best move is rook b8 immediately seeking quick counterplay with b7, b5. And if white is would be foolish enough to play a4, that would be not a good move here. That would, for white, create problems later on. Uh, black can, for instance, he could play perhaps knight a5 straight away, uh, threatening pawn on c4, threatening to play knight b3, winning the exchange, and also uh, paving the way for moves like c7, c5. Perhaps it actually should be preceded by e7, e5 at once, and if d5 to play knight a5. Knight c1 covering, and then black can play c5. And while obviously white cannot castle, risk castling queenside here. Castling kingside would be the only way to go, but uh, black's going to achieve very very solid counterplay. Bishop moves like bishop d7 
and uh, maybe B5 later. So A4 is, um, that's maybe worth testing, but I don't think it's the best move. Also con worth considering is Bishop H6. Uh, we saw that move um, played in that the Booz Vyagenzev game, and that's a move I have tried myself in practice. Uh, I had a game of Once Upon a Time back, uh, oh, back in Germany, 1994, against uh, international master Stefan Reschka, where my opponent played bishop takes h6, queen takes h6, e5, reacting in the center, but also he's uh, brought the white queen within proximity of black's king. Probably not a good idea. <clears throat> and after e5, I played rook d1. Also a good move, perfectly good move, would be to castle, but rook d1 kept my option of, believe it or not, castling short alive, and I figure the white king actually was safer on e1, or on the king's side, than it would be on the queen's side, where it might meet counterplay based on b7, b5. I think this is a fairly instructive example, so I'll let me go through this. <clears throat> Rook d1, my opponent played e takes d4, abandoning the center. Uh, I think he would be better served playing b7, b5, going for straight counterplay. Uh, chances for both sides, it's a dynamic, exciting position. I happen to favor white here uh, after b5, but it's. I think I would take white. My opponent played e takes d4. Um, not a terrible move, but it can lead to trouble if he's not careful. And now he played knight e5. I think here black should have played knight takes d4, rook takes d4, and get his queen off of that file and play queen e7. With a view towards playing queen e5, and who knows, maybe getting a queen g3 check in. Uh, the question is, do I have anything better than a move like queen g5? And uh, here I can see black has an option trading queens, queen with queen e5. Probably white's a little better, but uh, nothing that significant. So after e5, rook d1, e takes d4, knight takes d4, black played knight e5, and uh, so I haven't completed on my development, I'd like to get my rooks connected, g4 is out of the question, that's too impetuous here, it's reckless and just plain bad, and I'm not well enough to developed to play yet moves like c5, I'd like to, but I'd like a little more development first, so I played bishop e2, and uh, now black played a bit passively. Perhaps c5 here was a, a better prescription for success. c7, knight c2, queen b6, for instance, to keep me preoccupied on the queen side. My pawn on b2 is vulnerable. Another idea might be to just uh, get the queen off of that diagonal, queen e, uh, off that file, and play queen e7. However, black played c6, and now I played queen g5, and here that's uh, quite a good square for the queen. It ties the black queen down to the knight and f6. In some cases, I my, can, my dreams of g4 can be realized. <clears throat> All-purpose good move. Black played bishop d7, again a bit passive. Maybe queen c e7 was a better try. Bishop d7. I agree with Larry. <laughs> this is Roman Beck again. Uh, Black does have a passive position. 
because they played maybe passively before, but even if black played on last move instead of bishop d7, queen e7, I don't think it really uh, uh, changes um, much here. So white castle here. Actually, I present at this game, I was present and I saw a very well conducted game by Larry. Black finally made attempt uh, to get some activity. So white played c5. Obviously, a move was prepared by black, uh, by white. Uh, b5, c5 was prepared. d takes c. And white could have taken queen takes e5. And after cd, not rook takes d4, maybe even queen takes d4 with some advantage. But the move played by white was a lot stronger. Was knight e6 before taking the knight on e5 white completely damages black's pawn structure queen takes e5 and after c4 rook d6 white completely dominates whole board and uh, white won very shortly we don't have to go through all this uh, uh, no, the rest of the game. 